this segment is about making board games. Um, and so this is kind of a step back for all I build is electronic projects or software projects or machine learning projects or crazy complex Rube Goldberg type electronic projects to solve stupid problems in my house. But it's nice to take a break and do something in the physical space instead of you know staring at a computer screen or a oscilloscope or whatever it may be. This is me uh, when I had a beard um, and wore a hat. Um, so you didn't know I was bald in this, this picture. Um, this is me beating Bill. That's why he's got the sad face uh, in a game I really like called Lords of Vegas. So I like to play board games. And this is a great game to play, make variants of, experiment with. And so I'm going to try to talk about this experience uh, of making board games yourself. If you get interested in this, there's some follow-on resources you guys can get started on if you want. All right, so do anyone play a board game here? Yeah, what kind of games do you like? Carcassonne, Carcassonne. okay, that's a real, like a real game. <laughs> I like that. So board games are kind of at a renaissance right now. Uh, I think it happened because of the internet um, sharing playthrough videos. I know you guys don't like instruction videos on the internet, but that helped for board games because you didn't have to go to a game store, pick up a random box and invest $50 in something just based on its weight or the art on the box. Now there's a whole bunch of resources. So um, it's just people want to invest in board games and it's a big deal at the moment. So I try to come up with a definition for a board game versus like other types of games that may be out there. And we might call these games tabletop games. So games played on a physical surface rather than an electronic surface. Um, I like this definition. This came out of the book that we're reading in the book club. So it's an interactive mathematical system that um, you make it concrete. So that means you turn those system components into things. So this could be cardboard, paper, things like that. Um, and you try to tell a story throughout that game. So what is the story of Carcassonne? Does anyone know? <laughs> yeah, building your kingdom. And at the end of the game, you've got all these roads and buildings, and it's cool. Um, so you're building something. You're trying to tell that story. Some games don't have a well, well tied in story. Um, those are typically called Euro games. And then story-driven games um, have a lot of thematic story elements, but not a lot of great mechanical elements. So you'll see that definition come up. So in terms of mechanics, what, what's a mechanic? So in Carcassonne, the mechanic is tile placing. So you can see this really, these really long lists of mechanics. And so when you start playing games, you start to realize right away that there's, like, there's similarities in these games. So if you play Carcassonne, if you played a game called Suro, they both have a tile placing mechanic. Um, or mechanism, and these are these are an example of those type of mechanics. Any other games you've played? You've played one, Ben? Um, Benjamin? Settlers of Catan. So what's the mechanic from that game that you remember? Bidding. Yeah, bidding is probably the big, the big, bidding and trading is a big part of that game, right? So two sheep for one wood, you know, anyone will take that deal. So there's a bidding aspect of that. You're also building out the, your settlements on a map, things like that. But that's a classic Euro game because what, what's the story that, you're, that that is really serving? There's not much of a story there. There's really just the bidding aspect, things like that. So this is an, this is an example of the two. Um, there's Euro trash and Ameritrash uh, type games. <laughs> and so when you get into the business of it, games kind of fall into these categories, but lately it's kind of blending. Um, there's two schools of camp where your game is thematic, so you're gonna save the world from an alien race. Um, that's typically an Amer Ameritrash type game. <laughs> an example of that is Cosmic Encounter. Um, and then, then there are mechanical games, so Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico, the game itself, could be played in any scenario. You can come up with any story but it's a mechanical game. Um, uh, so the realistic thing is it's shades of gray. So there's all kinds of variations 
some are thematic. There's blends in the middle. So I've come up with a game development process. So if you want to do this, you just follow these steps. It's easy as one, two, three. Um, there's 15 steps, though. Um, <laughs> so there's a lot to get a game going. This is a hurry up and wait kind of business when you get into game design. Um, the, the thing that I've told people in the book club is you got to get the game out of your head. The game functionally is a physical space game. It's got to be put on a table. Um, so you got to get it out of your head in some way. You got to write down little bits of the rules. What do the cards look like? You got to get it out of your head. The more it stays in your head, your head kind of glosses over all the big details, makes the physical space work. You imagine it to work. And then as soon as you get it out of your head, you realize it doesn't work. And then you, this is how you start refining the game. Um, then you solo play test whatever you've come up with. This means you play with yourself and you say, I'm going to try this, I'm going to roll this dice, and I'm going to see what happens. And you're just mechanically seeing if it all works. You find out that it doesn't, and you, you repeat the process right here. Um, you take a first pass at the rules. So this is another good exercise for any software engineer or any developer or any doc writer, but just writing game rules. You start to realize how imprecise words are. You say, draw three cards in your rules. Does that mean up to three cards? Does it have to be three cards? What if there's only two cards on the deck? Can I not do that? Do, do I do the two? So you start to find out that uh, when you write the rules, conciseness, clarity, all of those little things uh, come out. Um, I also like to write down the experience that I'm trying to gather. So what am I expecting out of the play session? So this is from a designer's perspective. What am I trying to get these players to do? Um, like in Carcassonne, a designer could have written down, I'm trying to give them the experience of building out uh, a giant territory. And they're filling in, the, they're filling in a, a void. And they're architecting a, a settlement. Um, and then you do something called a supervised play test. And this is where, as the game designer, you get a group of people, um, you explain the game to them, and you watch them play it. And you have goals that you're trying to do. So in the software engineering world, this is a UX test. So you're trying to say, um, you, you know what you want them to do. You're not trying to coach them into doing it. So if you ever watched a software test and you see an outside user come in and they're like hovering over a button, but they don't click on it, and you just want to tell them to click on it and they don't do it, that's how you know your user interface is broken or that feature is not right or you have your new MATLAB function and they just don't, they don't get it, but it's supervised. You're, you're going to record that feedback. Um, you're going to get negative feedback for that process because your game is probably not good at this point. So don't, you don't get offended. You just keep, you keep plugging away. Um, once you've get kind of a, a game going, what you do then is then make a giant change in your game. So if you're a tile placing game, change it from tile placing to another mechanic. Switch it all out, um, and then try try the game out there. And what this does is kind of, it kind of points your game in a in a direction. So maybe your game is um, you don't know what you don't know if the game is working yet. You don't know if people are going to like it. But making a change kind of points you to okay, I really liked my first idea. So sometimes getting positive reinforcement is a good good thing to do. And then play the game again with yourself. See what's going on. A lot of this gets recursive. Um, you'll find out that it, that's why it takes forever to, to create a great board game. Um, then you do another su supervised play test, and you'll do many of those gathering feedback. You'll find out the game's broken. Um, when it's supervised, you step in and you can even change rules. <laughs> they may look at your rules and be like, um, do I pass the cards to my left or my right? You realize you didn't write that down. And so you realize how specific rules got to get sometimes. So the process isn't over yet. Um, what I like to do, um, and I've recommended to a few of the designs that uh, came up in the book club, put it on the shelf. At some point, package up everything you use to make that game, all the notes, print them all off, put them in a little file, and put it away. And what interesting things happen in that process. You start to, you step back, um, you start and you start another design. 
go through the same process with a whole nother design. And over time, you'll start to think of better ideas on that first game. If you keep thinking of that original game, then you've got something. If you literally a year goes by and you've never touched that shelf game, then you didn't like it yourself. So it's a way to test um, if others are gonna like that game. If you can't get over you know, thinking about it, but it's nice to start fresh. Um, then there's a phase of refinement, which is coming up in our book club, which we haven't talked about. There's these concepts called Flow and Fiero, um, and you need to find a balance between these two things. Flow is that state of mind where you're totally engaged, so the players are not on their phones, they're not thinking about something else, they're involved in the moment, that's Flow. Um, if they have to keep going to the rule book to clear up things, that breaks, that breaks flow because it wasn't obvious or they didn't figure it out. Fiero is when your players have moments where they figured out something in the middle of the game. They're like, ah, I know what I need to do. I'm gonna buy two of these gem mines. And if I do that, I'm gonna get the nobles to come visit my kingdom, whatever it is. So Fieros are little flashes of puzzle solving whenever you figure something out in your game. Then you refine those rules that you drafted from the beginning, and you're gonna keep doing this, keep refining those rules, schedule more supervised play tests. Um, once you get closer to the game being something that you wanna tell others about, you do an exercise called writing a one sheet, and a one sheet is essentially uh, everything about the game um, that you would say to someone if you were pitching the game to them. So. And you try to start with, uh, think about it is if you only had a minute with them, what would you tell them in the first 30 seconds, right? Are you going to tell them about all the rules or are you going to tell about the universe the game set in? So you do that on a one sheet. Um, and then at the very end, you create a prototype that is presentable. So you maybe cut cardboard, uh, print some things off a computer. You build something presentable because this is what you're going to try to uh, use to get people to uh, buy and license your game. And then the scary part is taking this presentable prototype, shipping it off to a group of people that maybe you networked with online, you ship them the game, and they're just going to play the game. Um, you're not involved in that process. All they have is the rules, the bits, the components, and feedback forms. And they're going to ship back the feedback forms on that game. And that is really scary. <laughs> uh, nowadays, people, uh, it's kind of cool when you do a blind or a unsupervised play test, you get people to Facebook Live it or they Twitch, you know, put it on Twitch or do it over Google Hangouts. You can actually watch them do it. Um, and you get some interesting uh, feedback. You can probably already see parallels into the software development process. Just sub out UX testing for play testing and so I'm going to go quickly into theory of design. So uh, if you went through the book club, you've seen this slide uh, probably uh, eight times <laughs> at this point. Um, but one of the things you want to do is when you're designing anything, it doesn't matter if it's a board game or a project, set some constraints to yourself. Um, I'm going to build a project with this kit. The constraint is the kit, right? Don't sit down in front of your desk and say, I'm going to build some electronics project. You know, so that's not too, once, if you're unbounded, you don't come up with great ideas. Um, and sometimes you need to borrow that idea. So like when Ned came to the zoo, uh, make, he wanted to make a zoo trope and got a bunch of us involved. That was our constraint. Another constraint was it's got to be done by August 17th. <laughs> you know, so sometimes times are constraints, things like that. And as engineers, if we don't have constraints, we never get anything done, right? So it's nice to have constraints. Um, Another rule that you want to think of is simplicity. Uh, simple things drive a lot of complexity. So if you see these big immersive board games and you have no idea how to develop that, realize it's all simple stuff that led up to that. They didn't start with the complex game. They built up to that complex game. This is a picture of where there's so much choice involved. Uh, but Joe brought up, if you don't know Joe, this is Joe over here. Joe brought up a uh, point where there's only two salad dressing recipes that exist. <laughs> there's the oil and vinegar based ones and there's the cream uh, based ones, that's it. But there are thousands and thousands of salad dressings. So you take 
basic things, you get, you get lots of variety out of those basic rules. So how do you uh, get started when you're, how, you know, what do you do to even try to build a game? You don't even, maybe you don't want to do this, but if you want to try it, you take things that you like, you copy them, and you start making some changes to those. So if you liked Carcassonne, um, read those rules, try to figure out what each rule means, take those rules in, um, make some new tiles, you know, try some things out, um, and, you know, you might make some ideas. Um, keep doing this with all kinds of games, not just the one game you like. Play lots of games, take in lots of information, read books. If you like uh, science fiction, read those books. Try to think about how you would take science fiction ideas and map them to mechanical elements of a game. And that's how you can come up with a game at the end of this. This process works for anything that you want to create. Um, the other thing is, is you never know when the good ideas are going to come. So they don't come like in every session. Um, so what I like to say to the people in the book club is you just got to keep doing this. So if you went through this process and you came up with something you don't like, well, you do it again. And you keep, you keep doing it, go back to it. And this is that adage of chopping wood and carrying water. Um, it comes. You'll have this spark where you're like, I know how to fix that game. I know, I know exactly what the difference is. Uh, I saw Blade Runner two weeks ago. I know exactly the theme that I want to put into my game. And so you don't know when that spark's going to come. So read more, uh, read more rule sets. Think about new game ideas. Study the game now if you're a player. Uh, become aware, like, what, what is this game uh, when you're playing your favorite game? So what do you need to build uh, games? Well, um, everything's kind of available. Um, I've said this in the book club. Uh, there's note cards and scissors and uh, rubber bands and printer labels and you need a printer. You need basic stuff. It's all available to you. Uh, you don't need to go buy a, but there's no special game design kit. Um, there's not, it's all available to you right now. So you can go anywhere and find uh, note cards, right? Um, there's post-it notes. So these are, so they fit nicely on top. So you can create little booklets if you want to. You can get creative. You can cut, cut the cardboard, cut the note cards down if you want to make these things. Uh, Irwin's even made uh, cardboard dice. <laughs> so you can get very creative with basic components. You don't have to go out and buy anything special. And doing that just puts off game design. And you know this if you're anyone who's in a creative field knows like uh, a musician or somebody that they just keep buying more guitars and more strings and more amplifiers and more effects pedals, but they don't actually play guitar. <laughs> and so this is similar to this where um, at some point you just got to realize you have what's available. You just, you're just not doing it if you want to make a game or anything else. Um, the other thing is, is you have a lot of games you don't play anymore, right? Maybe you don't play Monopoly anymore or your neighbors have a yard sale and you see all these stacks of board games. You know, buy those, you know, old board games for a couple of dollars, take all the pieces, and now you've got game bits. If you really need little buildings for your prototype, little buildings exist. You can just, there's thousands of copies of Monopoly not being played at any given time. An old deck of cards, if you don't have note cards, well, everyone has decks of cards. And if you have post-it notes, now you have custom, <laughs> custom cards. So you don't have to go out and uh, send off to a printer and get all these things printed. Um, the other thing is there's these dollar stores that are around, like Dollar General and Dollar Tree and things like these. All, each one of these games were a dollar. Um, and this one, you know, the Chinese checkers game, comes with a game board even. So you can put, you can stick a bunch of cards on top of that and now you've got your own blank game board if you don't want the Chinese checkers board. But it also came with all these pawns in different colors. So for $1, you're getting a game board and like a dozen or so pawns. So not it's not magnetic. <laughs> for $1, it's not magnetic. <laughs> so it uses friction. Um, so... <laughs> So 
it's kind of cool. <laughs> the, uh, so play testing is a big part of your game. There's three types of play testing. I've alluded to these. Um, the easiest one to get done is play test by yourself. All these things are easy to avoid. Um, I like to think about this stuff because I know it works. <laughs> but as soon as I try these things, they get very difficult. Um, and uh, if you really got to tie in your electrical experience and you really can't just pull off an analog game by yourself, you can make digital dice with Arduino. <laughs> and so I end up doing these things um, to waste a lot of time. Uh, <laughs> I have literally in my house 4,000 uh, six-sided dice. Um, but I will make an electronic version <laughs> or use MATLAB uh, to do it. Uh, and it's fun to take these tangents. Um, I want to see games with more electronic connection. This is because that's my background. I have to have colored lights in my game somewhere. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to definitely get that done. But yeah, you can waste a lot of time building things. Um, so game design is fun. The reason you do this for solo playtesting, maybe your second player, you can automate their moves. So you play your perspective and their player, they do one of four things on their turn. So you hit the button on the Arduino, it resets and puts another, <laughs> another dice uh, roll up there. Um, so anyway, so here's what it looks like. These are fresh. This is yesterday. Um, this is Erwin. If you don't know Erwin, he's back here. He created this game called Cat Stampede in the last few weeks. And he did a supervised play test at the uh, board game group that meets every Wednesday and Friday here at MathWorks. And so he had goals and wrote down notes and observed the gameplay. Um, they had questions that came up. He figured things out. Um, and it's a fun game. Uh, and Joe got crushed uh, <laughs> twice in the game. Um, but it was fun to watch people play a game. And it's also fun to see that this game didn't exist uh, five weeks ago. So it's kind of cool. And now here it is, using the cardboard um, and all those resources you bought at Staples. Um, not out of the supply closet. So <laughs> exactly. You wrote out your rules. And then you realize like little things, right? They're like, well, what if a tie happens? And you start to realize like, oh, I didn't catch all these different scenarios. Um, this is a play test of one of my games. Uh, this is what it looked like. You're not trying to get too sophisticated in your, you know, design. Um, this is, I took this a little too far for a play test because I had to change everything after I, I did this. And I spent, that's a hundred little squares of cardboard that I cut <laughs> and glued to a table. Um, it was a waste of time, but I figured out a lot of stuff in my supervised play test. Um, and then, see, you can enjoy some of the tangents. If you don't like that, well, do it in uh, Unity 3D and build AI <laughs> to test the game that's broken. Um, and, you know, which takes like, no, this is, uni this is like Unity 3D. This is like, you know, hardcore. Um, yeah, it's Unreal Game Engine. This is like building it out uh, all yourself. Um, and then you can waste a lot of time game developing. But there's a fun part to game development. This is from a convention that I went to over the summer. They had this game called Aerodrome. It's a great game, um, but I've played it in so many different variations, and people really like the crafting aspect of game development. So every time I come to play this game um, over the last you know, 15 years, the panels get more and more sophisticated. <laughs> and you realize the game is still the same game, but now it feels like I'm sitting in front of a front of a cockpit and I'm pushing pegs in there and things like that. And those planes go up and down on telescoping. All of this is handmade, which is really cool. Um, yeah, they are 22 shells. Those are 22 shells. And so you have to plan if you're going to shoot uh, on your turn because these are World War Two, World War One planes that only had a limited supply of uh, ammo. So when you're out, you're just basically flying around trying to hit someone. That's all you can do at that point. And you get these uh, chips when you cause damage on other people, and then everyone adds up their chips, and that's who, who won the game. So it's a great, great game. Uh, but the craft element is awesome, you know? And every year it just gets a little bit better. Um, so prototyping, 
Um, this is a, another game. So that's what the that's like what the tools of the trade look like. Lots of glue sticks, things like that. This is what my uh, shelf looks like. I'm obsessed with collecting game parts and sorting them. So that's my favorite part of game design. <laughs> and I have a label maker that I just purchased. So they will be labeled um, <laughs> at some point. So and I told someone I got a big giant bag of bingo chips with assorted colors. And so I got the I got it um, to uh, put bases on some pieces and things. But before I did that, I had to sort them uh, into all their colors. And that was hours of doing that. Um, the other thing to do, this is a picture from an airport where I left my uh, laptop bag at my in-laws house. And I show up at the airport and it's a six hour delay on my flight. And so I'm doing nothing. They had a little uh, pharmacy and they had a pack of note cards and they had a game. Um, I forget what the game was called at this point. Oh, bun Bunko. Bunko. And so I took the dice out of the game and I was like, you know, I'm going to practice what I preach. I have enough here. I bought a pencil, a pack of note cards, this game. So I had dice and I started developing a game. So it's a good constraint to have. And, and it's nice to have a block of time where I didn't have my laptop, didn't have my tablet, didn't have my anything. And my phone was on 16% uh, battery. So <laughs> it was great. Actually, the six hours are great. Um, so here's some games that were created throughout the, the book club. This is from George uh, Einhorn. Um, the reason why the, the components are here, I, I gave the class constraints. They had to use these note cards um, and uh, two sets of four colored uh, bingo chips. That's why I had to sort them. Um, there was like 2,000 of them. I had to get them sorted to hand these out. There was also an envelope involved um, and a post-it note. And so George created a game called Vector Dash um, with these components. Um, this is John Fluitt's game. So he, he took the components, used them slightly different, but you can see the constraints are all in here and it's kind of cool, the variations. This is a space duel game. He, he wrote a bunch of flavor text, which is uh, spices up the game. He talked about, um, you know, the game is set in the future, but they sell settle arguments the old fashioned way. <laughs> uh, so they go up to space and do a space duel. It's actually a really solid game, but he's on his like 15th iteration. So um, and he showed me last night all these different variations of the game and how he got to this. We played it and it is totally solid. Um, and then he pulled out of a fo fire fo file folder of all these other variations of the game. So, um, and he got he got through that with uh, with a lot of uh, solo play testing. So here's Joe's game. And this game went through a lot of refinement. Um, this is called Hedge Wizards. So with the cool aspects of this, you see the, the cards, you see the bingo chips. He even made this cool flap thing with the uh, post-it note to reveal each other's move, um, and then he created a version. I, I don't think you had your components, but you did have a deck of cards and you had some token checkers and things like that. So he created that version. And an awesome aspect is he got his son involved. What, cheap labor. Cheap labor. Uh, and they made a var variation of the game. So that's awesome that, you know, it went all this, this uh, you know, you went through lots of different versions. You're up to like, you have to be six different... <laughs> yeah, 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 good to sue them. So prototyping, this is why I needed those bingo chips. I found these little dog figurines. They needed bases because they didn't stand up very well. But if you glue them to a bingo chip, they stand up perfectly. Um, so another thing you do with bingo chips, um, you can see the beginnings of the sorting going on. But you can write on the bingo chips with a marker. So if you need custom components, you're done. Um, the other thing you can do, there's all these tokens. And if you have a printer, you can get clear mailing labels, print out your symbols. Um, you'll find, I have a friend that's uh, colorblind. So he play tested one of my games 15 years ago. He couldn't see, can't see between red and green. And almost every game has red and green in it. So since that day, I now put a symbol on the pieces so you can say the chevron versus the, you know, fleur de lis or whatever, something. Um, the other thing I, I put a 
giant piece of uh, dry erase board on my uh, table so I can just write quick notes. Um, I like the uh, I like to get to the get to the game design as fast as possible rather than putting a lot of barriers in there. Even though you've seen all my tangents, um, I embrace those uh, those tangents. Uh, another thing you got there's all kinds of uh, other ways to go. Um, if you want to, if you're you're learning all that web app stuff and the makers boff, so you want to build card templates <laughs> and icons, well, you can build a card generator pretty easily, so you can waste time in that space if you want. But it's actually nice if you make a change, they cascade to all. Like if you have new border art, they all change, things like that. Um, and this is what Magic the Gathering cards look like in prototype form. So if you've played that game, that's what they look like. Um, this is how a game can go from cardboard all the way to published. So it's a game that's coming out. So you can go from different components. You can just write unicorn on the board. You don't have to spend 45 minutes drawing a unicorn or farming out unicorn design. You can just write unicorn. Don't color it in blue, you write blue. You know, those, those types of things. They get you very, very fast. And that game comes out next year. Um, we actually have a published game designer at MathWorks. Like a few, actually. Joe is a published uh, game designer. I've got one of his couple of games up here. But Alex Churchill from, from the UK office uh, he's playing a prototype of his game called Steamworks, um, but it's a steampunk, <laughs> steampunk tile placement game um, with a worker placement mechanic. So you can, so you got your theme, you got everything there. So if you want to get started, find an hour to focus every day, read rules, make variations of games you like, um, and enjoy the tangents. There's an awesome psychology part of the game, the crafting part. Enjoy the failures, build relationships. And there's a bunch of resources for you. Uh, all my workshop materials are on my website called Light Fun Games. And uh, there's Board Game Geek, and then there's the internet. So if you need more resources, the internet is a good place. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I did that on purpose. There's no way for me to get you to the internet from this PowerPoint. So. All right, thanks, Joe.